you know, Alan Dershowitz has spent his entire career justifying Israel murdering Arab children. That's when he's not busy defending pedophiles and rapists like Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein. So I'm not okay, surprised so that he's going to get into personal today attacks to defend now. terrorist let's, attacks. Let's Let me finish, from, Alan. Let's stay Let me away finish, from Alan. Let me finish, Alan. Let me finish, Alan. And get to Let the me, merits. I, am but I you're wrong? not going to attack me personally for being a defense lawyer. I defend Arabs. I defend Muslims. I have defended. Just to raise another point because it is important. We are after one year in Gaza, which was a catastrophe for all parties. Israel achieved nothing in this war. Israel's position today in any parameter is much worse. All right. I'm not ashamed of saying what I just said. It's objectively true. That said, you did just justify what Leon Panetta, the former CIA director, called an act of terrorism, Israel blowing up cellular devices. And we should all be concerned with that standard Israel set. Because by your logic, Alan, does that make it okay to blow up the cellular devices of Israeli soldiers who are off duty, far from any battlefield, going about their daily lives with their kids in grocery stores, yes, in that, hospitals? That, would be legal. that is what that Israel would be did legal. to Lebanon last week. That would be that wow, would be legal. Wow, because we know that that, that would, would be, be called legal. a terrorist that would attack be legal if it happened. Under the law. And then, but it would and then be let me just say, I am very upset right now. I am very upset right now because Israel has just murdered 300 of my fellow countrymen in Lebanon in an indiscriminate carpet bombing campaign based on lies. I have people calling me, telling me the horrors they're experiencing at this very moment under Israeli just stop bombardment. Just firing rockets. And it's, just this is stop as- firing rockets and it will end. That's all. Just stop firing at Israeli communities and civilians and Before it will end. Anybody it's fired all Hezbollah. Any- the recent debate on Piers Morgan Uncensored was nothing short of an eye-opener, particularly for those who have long defended Israel's military operations in Lebanon and Gaza. Alan Dershowitz, a prominent figure known for his unflinching defense of Israeli military actions, found himself in one of the most humiliating moments of his career. Faced with simple yet pointed questions regarding the crimes of the Israeli occupation army in Lebanon, Dershowitz was clearly outmatched, struggling to maintain his footing in a web of contradictions and half-truths. It was a moment that exposed the glaring weaknesses in the narrative Israel has long pushed about its so-called moral conduct in the region. Despite efforts to suppress our voices, we remain committed to delivering truthful, fact-based news and analysis from Lebanon and Gaza. Your support is crucial in ensuring independent journalism thrives. Please like and share this content with those around you and subscribe to help us reach a wider audience. What truly caught viewers' attention was how effortlessly Dershowitz's arguments unraveled. How can anyone defend the deaths of over 500 people in Lebanon in the latest round of hostilities? How can such an operation, which blatantly targets civilians, be justified under any pretense? In trying to rationalize the unjustifiable, Dershowitz only managed to highlight the great flaw in Israel's justification for its continued aggression in the Middle East. The usual arguments about self-defense rang hollow, especially when confronted with the cold, hard facts of Israel's deliberate targeting of civilian areas. Watching Dershowitz struggle to free himself from these arguments was nothing short of a spectacle. The more he tried to explain away the deaths and destruction, the more he seemed to expose the lack of moral grounding behind Israel's military actions. Rania Kalek and Gideon Levy, the two voices of reason in the debate, came armed with facts and a determination to hold Dershowitz accountable. They weren't just there to debate, they were there to dismantle the hollow justifications that have been used to excuse Israel's aggression for years. Okay, I came on here to talk about Lebanon. If Alan's going to continue to interrupt me and not let me speak, no, no, I've just really asked no you a question. I... Would you like me to answer your question, or yes. are we going to let Alan talk? No, no, it? I've asked right. you a question. You it's respond true. to me. On October 8th, Hezbollah started firing at Israel in solidarity with Palestinians. And since then, we've heard from Hezbollah repeatedly say they will stop firing when Israel stops its aggression on Gaza. Israel has repeatedly refused to stop its aggression on Gaza and things have escalated in the north and all also say that, and this is according to the BBC, 80% of the cross-border attacks have actually gone from Israel to Lebanon. This is a two-way fight taking place. Okay, but let me ask you, okay, after what you just said, hang on, what you just said was interesting. So you concede that Hezbollah on October the 8th, the day after Israel suffers its most horrific attack on its people since the Holocaust, something which if you extrapolated it to the population of America is like 30 or 40 9-11s, that the very next day Hezbollah decides to launch a rocket attack 
on Israel. In what possible world is that something that you would not expect Israel to defend extremely aggressively, given they've just endured this appalling terrorist attack? I mean, Piers, I can't believe you just called it a holocaust. That's actually offensive to I the didn't Holocaust. call it. I, I called. We can talk about. I, no, sorry. You said don't the, don't you misquote said the worst me. Attacks Hang on, since the Rania, Holocaust. That's to be offensive clear, to the Holocaust. I said it was the worst attack on people of uh, Jewish faith since the Holocaust of the Second World War. That's what she I said. She defends it. She defends it. She well, that's what it I said. Just to be clear, October 7th. that was what I said. Yeah. So my point, though, is you accept that Hezbollah launched these rockets literally hours after Israel has suffered this heinous terrorist attack. You know, of course they're going to defend themselves. Why wouldn't they? Any country in the world in that situation would defend itself. And it wasn't an attack. Well, I'd like to ask you, at what point do Arabs get the right to defend themselves? At what point does our security matter? Israel has spent the last almost 12 months carrying out a genocide in Gaza. They've killed over 41,000 people, and we all know that's a huge underestimate. Over 16,000 children. Who started that one? Just Who today, Israel that has war? killed 300 Lebanese war? people, including 21 Who Lebanese children. Who started that war? At what point do we get to defend ourselves? And Alan, come on, Israel's been stop, massacring stop and occupying and terrorizing and you... its neighbors for the past 76 years. Israel needs to stop terrorizing its neighbors, stop being an apartheid settler if, colony, if you and maybe Israel its neighbors alone, won't fire at it because you left its neighbors alone, are defending themselves okay. against an invading right, let me bring in, against Okay, let me bring in Gideon to be waiting very patiently, Gideon Levy from Haritz. Yeah. Gideon, you've, you've heard both sides here uh, expressed very forcefully. What is your overview of where we are now? Because it seems from where we are, uh, I'm currently in London, but it seems to the outside world that Israel is basically ramping up for a full-fledged war with Hezbollah in Lebanon at the same time that it's still conducting a full-fledged war with Hamas in Gaza. Absolutely. You see, the main problem is that under the excuse or under the umbrella of self-defense, which in many cases is justified, Israel thinks that it has the right to do whatever it wants. The 7th of October enabled Israel to go wild in Gaza, to cross any possible legal or moral border, and to kill 41,000 people. Why? Because of the 7th of October. After the 7th of October, we have the right to do whatever we want, and nobody will tell you, you heard the propaganda of the ambassador. Same now with Hezbollah. Hezbollah launched rockets on Israel. We have to defend itself. Until here, very well. But because we are defending ourselves, we have the right to do whatever we want. For example, the devices. For example, to kill today almost 300 people in one day. Is there a limit? I would like just to ask you one thing, Piers, mm. and please answer with honesty. Yeah. If Hezbollah would have spread those devices in Israel to soldiers, and hundreds of people would have got blind out of it, mm. how would the world react after it? What would you say about those terrorists, about those monsters who do such things? Why, when Israel is doing, it's always justified. Whatever it does, it's always justified by self-defense. Exactly well, well, I would say, OK, I would say, it's it's exactly my, well, let me give my response, Alan. I mean, my response to that would be, as I said to the ambassador, there are very serious concerns about whether that was legal, first of all. But secondly, as we just heard from Rania, when Hezbollah chose on October the 8th, when Israel was on its knees from this appalling uh, a, a monstrous terror attack on its people with 1,200 people slaughtered, nearly 7,000 more wounded, many of them irreparably for the rest of their lives with terrible injuries. Uh, when Hezbollah decided their response to that, before Israel had done anything, was to fire a lot of rockets in solidarity with these terrorists into Israel, then in that moment they made a calculation and Israel was always going to respond, as Hamas knew it would respond to what they did on October the 7th. And the question for me has always been proportionality. You know, what is proportional? I don't have the answer, but I've asked everybody I can that question, because it seems to me that is at the heart of this. 
Israel well, has a right to defend an itself, to but, at, but at what level? So, there, so just, uh, Alan, I'll come to you in a second, but, but Gideon, you know, that is my sure. honest answer. You know, I think you raise a very good point, which I'll put to Alan in a moment, but if this had been an attack on 3,000 people in Israel, or say, say 95% by IDF, uh, blinding and wounding and killing uh, a lot of them, I think there would have been a lot of global outrage. Yes, I do. But th that depends how you categorise Hezbollah against the IDF. Uh, and maybe I can come to Alan for that. I mean, Alan, it's a good question from Gideon, isn't it? I mean, if it was the other way, the other way around, a, what would you have said? There are, well, first, the legal issue is clear. You are allowed to attack an Israeli soldier while he's sleeping or while he's shopping, uh, as long as it doesn't create a disproportionate impact on civilian populations. So you would have found that, just to be clear, children. it's important, Alan. It's legally, really important. Legally. To be legally, clear, that, to be clear legally. from a legal point of view, you would have had no argument if Hezbollah had done that to 3,000 members of the IDF in Israel. Israeli soldiers, yes. Now, to get one soldier, you can't kill three children. To get a commander, you can kill two or three civilians. There is an answer to the proportionality. We look at history. We look at what America did in Afghanistan and Iraq. We look at what Great Britain did, what France did. And we have a history of proportionality. And so, yes, the answer is that if a person is a combatant, it doesn't matter whether they're sleeping, whether they're cooks, or whether they're machine gun operators. If they're a combatant, they're a target. Once they are a target, you have to make sure that when you kill them or wound them, you're not creating disproportionate impact on civilians. What happened with the events a couple of weeks last week is that many, many, many combatants were killed and a teeny, teeny, teeny number of non-combatants were killed. It was the best example well, of proportionality in so the why, history why, so of Alan, modern why, warfare. Why is it, Alan, why is the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights saying that what, happened, very simple. what happened was a Look, war crime? Because Abba even said many years ago, if the United Nations introduced the resolution that the earth was flat and that Israel would flatten it, it would win 144 to 22 with 43 abstentions. That's been the history of the United Nations. It's been the history of left wing academics. It's the history of your Lebanese person here who says the original sin of Israel that it can never be forgiven for. It was clear from the outset that they had no in intention of letting Arab Dershowitz country. escape it's the conversation unscathed. As the discussion progressed, okay. it became obvious that the old defense that Israel is simply defending itself no longer held any water. The reality of the situation, both in Gaza and now in Lebanon, is that Israel is the aggressor. It has been for decades, and the continued devastation in the region only further solidifies this truth. Israel's policy of refusing peace with its neighbours, choosing instead to rely on brute military force and technological superiority, has become glaringly apparent. The ongoing conflict in Lebanon is just another chapter in Israel's long history of trying to force its will upon the region. The excuse that they are merely defending themselves no longer holds up especially when their actions result in the deaths of so many civilians. The truth is, Israel has long been the one refusing peace, actively pursuing policies that destabilize the region in order to solidify its occupation and control. One of the most damning revelations to come out of the debate was the suggestion that Israel knew about the planned Palestinian attack on October 7, 2023, yet chose not to act in order to use it as a justification for their current offensive. The very idea that Israel would allow such an attack to happen, only to turn around and use it as a pretext for the destruction of Gaza, is shocking. It's a narrative that shifts the entire conversation about who the true aggressor in this situation is. Rania Kalek and Gideon Levy wasted no time pointing out this hypocrisy, leaving Dershowitz with little room to manoeuvre. Gideon's response to what Alan yeah. just said, please. Yeah. Thank you. I, I really feel uh, an overdose of propaganda, first the ambassador and, and then Ellen. Uh, you see, Israel will always stick to the fact that it is the victim. Whatever happens, Israel is the victim. 41,000 people killed in Gaza, and this no, is how many of them are How can... How, how, many, Just how many of the 41,000 are civilians? How many are com combatants? I'll tell you exactly. You haven't, left I'll, you haven't mentioned. I'll, yeah, I'll tell you exactly. I'll Let's tell hear. you. I'll tell you. No, but let me first but answer. Don't say 41,000. 17,000 of... What? 
17,000 okay, so of them were children. Children are combatants. innocent. Okay. Always, always, okay, always. So let's, if you can let, live in peace, if figures. you can live in peace, no, no, let me finish now. I didn't interrupt yes, you. Yes, If you yes, can live, can in, live peace in peace with, with that. No, let me finish. I didn't interrupt you. Let others talk. If you can live in peace with 17,000 children, you have a problem. I cannot no, live in no, peace no, no, with 17,000 children. You, you, you cannot live with it in peace. Point. But let me finish. You no. said seven. No, no, no. 17,000 children will come. Killed. 17,000 no, 17, children. Isn't the point? Okay, let me interrupt no, no, no. here. Because it, let's you, talk about we're talking over each other. Uh, no, don't talk over each other. Let me finish. Uh, here's the point I would make, Gideon. But I, I would like... Yeah, finish your point, yes, Gideon, then I'm like going to say to something. Take it. Yes. No, finish your let point, Gideon. Let me take it. Yes. I want just to raise another point because it is important. We are after one year in Gaza which was a catastrophe for all parties. Israel achieved nothing in this war. Israel's position today in any parameter is much worse than before this war. You name it, what security, economically, what they, what it's done? a pariah state. Lay down their arms? Just what should they have done? Let me sing, finish. Sing Kambaya with Hamas? Now Israel, hush. Now Israel is aiming to do the very same thing in Lebanon. Not learning one lesson. But Israel, okay, but, but Gideon, 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 Israel, Gideon, Israel's response would be that no, actually, we have managed to massively dismantle Hamas's ability to yeah. operate as terrorists. Yeah. We've yeah. destroyed many of the we, we'll tunnels. Meet you in two We've killed years. thousands Let's meet of terrorists. in two years, and we'll see. Well, yeah, okay, but yeah. no, I'm just Let's saying what they're... Let's meet in two years. I'm saying what they're arguing. I'm saying what, what their argument and is. And what we created. I'm saying what but their, the argument, what their argument would be. Brania, over to you. Yeah, but I, I will well, answer I to this argument. To Let's meet said. in two years. Okay, we'll do that. Rania? Well, I just want to answer to what Piers just said about Israel dismantling. I want, when you talk about these groups that you call terrorist organizations, you call Hamas terrorists, Hezbollah terrorists, Alan says Israel's just surrounded from everywhere, everybody hates them, and they're always throwing rockets at them. You Where do these groups terrorists. come from? You don't think Take Hezbollah, terrorists? for example. You don't think okay, they're terrorists? Okay, Alan, seriously, you make it so impossible to come on this program. Let me finish my point. You get to talk five minutes uninterrupted, and let me have my moment to talk, and then you can accuse me of all kinds of things, okay? Let's talk about where Hezbollah comes from. Hezbollah emerged, it's Lebanese people, who emerged in the mid-1980s because Israel viciously invaded and occupied Lebanon. I mean, that invasion and occupation was so horrific. Ronald Reagan called up the For Israeli no Prime reason. Minister Menachem no Begum at the time reason, right? and, told him, and told him to stop carrying out what Ronald Reagan referred to as a holocaust on Beirut. That is how vicious the Israeli invasion and occupation was. And under those conditions emerged a group of Lebanese people who picked up arms to defend their homes and land from occupation, and that's how you get Hezbollah. And they kicked the Israelis out in 2000. And it's since then, they have been seen nonsense. by many Lebanese. You don't have to agree with it. I'm telling you the reality of the situation. I live in Lebanon, I know. Since then, they have been seen by many Lebanese as a force of protection against further Israeli invasions of Lebanon. And if I'll also remind vote, you, Hezbollah has out. never invaded Israel. Israel has repeatedly invaded Lebanon. The same goes for Hamas, but by the, the way. Where did they, Hamas they come from? They haven't sent rockets. Hamas is a group of Palestinians have... who picked up arms to defend their people against Israeli aggression. So if you want the aggression against Israel to stop, if you can even call it aggression. If you want that to stop, Israel needs to stop invading, occupying, and massacring okay. its neighbors. People so in your neighborhood let's, let's, are not going to like you if you continue to kill their families and steal their homes and land. It's really basic. So let's guys. turn to Gaza. Let's turn to Gaza. In, 19, in, in 2005, every single Israeli, dead and alive, they actually dug up the bodies Every single Israeli left Gaza. Gaza could have become the Singapore of the Mediterranean. There was not a, uh, uh, an occupation. There was not a single soldier. And then Hamas took over and fired 6,000 rockets in a very short period of time. If Gaza had just decided to use all the money they came, got from Europe, built a beautiful port, there could be peace. But 
the, but Hamas decided to invade Israel, attack Israel, culminating in October 7th. But for years, there were tens of thousands of rockets that came in. Of course, Israel's going to defend itself. You say Hezbollah's never invaded Israel. Thousands of rockets. They have 100,000 rockets aimed at Israel's midsection. A, a, an invasion doesn't require a troop. It requires a rocket. So Israel has been defending itself from the day it came into existence in 1948, there could have been a wonderful Palestinian state uh, on a, and a tiny little Israeli state. And all the Arab countries decided to conduct a genocidal war to destroy the nation state of the Jewish people. And Israel has been fighting for its very survival ever since. So let's get real here. Okay, let me, if let me Israel just... laid down his arms, there would be genocide. Okay, let if me the ask... Arabs laid down their arms, there would be peace. For years... Israel has relied on the argument that it is simply defending itself from hostile neighbours. But in this debate, it became clear that this defence no longer works. The ongoing devastation in Lebanon, just like in Gaza, has nothing to do with defence and everything to do with maintaining control and occupation. The bombardment of Lebanon wasn't a reaction to an immediate threat. It was part of a larger plan to destabilise the region, weaken resistance movements and maintain Israel's dominance. The way Dershowitz floundered under the pressure of the debate was telling. He could not effectively answer why so many civilians were being killed, why homes were being bombed, and why Israel seems so intent on using overwhelming force against a population that poses no existential threat to them. His defence of these actions, particularly in Lebanon, came off as hollow and insincere. This moment showed the cracks in Israel's carefully crafted image of itself as a victim fighting for survival. The reality is, Israel has been the aggressor, and this debate brought that fact into sharp focus. Rania Kalik and Gideon Levy masterfully turned the conversation back to where it should be, on the human cost of Israel's actions. The death toll in Lebanon is staggering, and the destruction wrought by Israeli forces has left entire communities in ruins. These aren't military targets. These are homes, schools and hospitals. The idea that this can be justified in the name of self-defence simply doesn't hold up when examined closely. Dershowitz's inability to offer a coherent explanation for these atrocities spoke volumes. The most humiliating part of the debate wasn't just that Dershowitz was outmatched by facts and logic, but that he was caught defending the indefensible. The argument that Israel holds any moral high ground in these conflicts has been shattered. This debate was a turning point, where even staunch defenders of Israel's policies were forced to confront the reality that their justifications no longer hold any weight. What this means moving forward is that the global conversation around Israel's actions in the Middle East is shifting. The days of relying on the defence of self-defence are coming to an end. More and more, people are seeing through the narrative and recognising Israel as the aggressor in these conflicts. The humiliation of Alan Dershowitz in this debate is just a microcosm of the larger reckoning that is taking place. The world is waking up to the reality of Israel's actions in Lebanon, Gaza and beyond, and it's becoming harder for even the most seasoned defenders to justify the continued aggression.